Well, I'm delighted to see you all here today. And what I'm going to uh, say in these brief introductory remarks, really, is something about why, if you are interested at all in economics, or if you are an economist, uh, you should realize that you're part of the cause of human optimism uh, and human well-being, and above all, uh, of the kind of innovations that have transformed our world for the better and are continuing to do so. Now, it's just under 200 years uh, since Thomas Carlyle famously dubbed uh, economics the dismal science. Uh, this is a view which many, many other people have uh, followed ever since. Uh, Oscar Wilde famously saying that the economist is the man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. You all know the script, I'm sure. The idea being that if you're an economist or interested in economics, you're a hard-hearted, soulless, flinty-souled person uh, who is just completely averse to and out of touch with the finer things of life. In fact, that's the direct opposite of the truth. Because if you look at the course of human history, economists are the optimists. Not the foolish, utopian, uh, soft-headed optimists, but the hard-headed, realistic optimists. The people who understand what wealth is, where it comes from, and how, therefore, we can make the world a better place than it has been for most of human history. Now, for most of human history, up until really the time when economics began to appear as a discipline in the late 18th century, to be a pessimist was the rational, sensible thing to be. Jesus himself, what higher authority can you have, uh, had told his disciples in one of his last remarks to them, the poor you will always have with you. And for most of human history, yes, that was true. The idea that you could improve the conditions of the great majority of human beings was a bizarre and strange fantasy for most of the past. Our ancestors lived in the world where living standards rose very, very slowly, if indeed they uh, rose at all. The living conditions of an Italian peasant uh, in the later 18th century were not that much different from those of the, his equivalent uh, in the late Roman Empire or the Middle Roman Empire, or indeed even earlier than that. There were some slight improvements in technology, but basically living standards had hardly changed over 2,000 years or more. Not only that, but human beings lived lives that were incredibly constrained. The range of options open to human beings for most of human history was radically limited. Uh, one of the many reasons why I'm skeptical about people who claim to be able to remember their past lives uh, is that most of them seem to have spent their past lives as princesses or high priestesses uh, or something of that kind. And putting it quite frankly, the odds are seriously against that uh, because 80 to 90% of all of our ancestors were peasant farmers. That's what most people did. That was what they had to look forward to. It was really the only option for most people. And it's the economists who, more than anyone else, if you will, uh, were able to gradually realize uh, that this was not inevitable, that things could be different, uh, that there were ways in which you could actually increase uh, wealth, make people better off. And the goal of economists, the great central goal of economists, from Smith onwards through all the great economists, regardless of what they disagree about, has been to improve the condition of the least well off. The great mission of economics, in other words, is to find how to so arrange human affairs that the condition of the least well-off will improve steadily and continuously. And how much that has happened. You have no idea how historically fortunate you are, perhaps. You are the richest people ever in human history. Most of you are far wealthier in any meaningful sense than even the 1% of, say, 17th century Europe. Most of you are richer, have access to more uh, services, products, luxuries than even someone like, say, the Sun King, Louis XIV of France, the most powerful man in Europe in his day. The average incomes of people worldwide since 1750 have gone up by a factor of 16. We are 16 times richer than our ancestors were a brief two and a bit centuries ago. That is something that had never happened before. The world has been utterly and radically transformed. And it's economists who have both explained why this is happening, but played no small part in bringing it about. As I say, it is they who are the optimists. Uh, it is others who are the pessimists, the Carlyles, the Ruskins uh, of this world. And it's also worth saying something about how our values have been transformed by uh, the economists by this process of transformation. The word economics, as some of you may know, comes from the Greek word for a, house word, for a household. 
Uh, and that's originally what economics meant. It meant the art of household management. Now, one of the features of most of human history is that the figures who are held up for admiration, the kind of activity that is seen as admirable uh, is the warrior and the activity of the warrior, fighting and war. If you go to major capital cities like London, they are full of statues of guys sat on a horse, often holding a sword. The hero, the hero figure in most literature and most myths, is the person who slays the monster, who fights the war, the conqueror, the king, the ruler. In the world that has come about today, the world we live in, the real heroes are not warriors, but merchants. Not prophets or priests, but innovators, inventors, and discoverers. It is the domestic that is elevated. Ordinary, quotidian, mundane comfort. That is what is elevated. That is what is seen as worthwhile, rather than the idea of the heroic. And you can think of a whole number of works of popular literature where you can see this. If you think, for example, about J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter, uh, what is the climax of that book? The climax of the book, at the, right at the end of it, is a scene of domestic family life when the older Harry is taking his uh, child to Hogwarts. Similarly, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, the final scene of the book, which is what, in many ways, the book is all about, is when Sam comes back home and his wife puts his baby daughter in his lap and he says, well, I'm back. It's all about the virtue of the everyday, the ordinary, the quotidian, the fact that these things can be made better, that human life can be transformed for the good, not through uh, the activity of war or even of uh, martial heroism, but rather through the simple but profoundly transformative activities of trade, of exchange, of voluntary cooperation, and above all, of innovation and invention. And that's why we will be looking in this uh, conference today at the kind of uh, new ideas, new inventions, new developments that are taking place, and how these are likely to transform our world for the better, or maybe not, because uh, we don't want to simply give you uh, one side of the story. There are also people who do think that maybe uh, the best days are behind us in some ways. Uh, and if so, we need to think about what that means and what it might imply for our future uh, in the years ahead.